2007, meeting number 16-2007. And we will begin with roll call by the town clerk. Chairman McKinney. Here. Councilor Backer. Here. Councilor Dill. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Lynch. Here. Councilor Rowe. Here. Councilor Swift Payetta. Here. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Okay, now we'll move on to the review of minutes. Meeting number 15, held October 10th, 2007. Would someone like to make a motion? David? I move the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of the Town Council dated Wednesday, October 10, 2007. Second. Jim? Okay, any um, amendments or changes? David? Um, just. Uh, I think there was one item. Um, on item number 151, the acceptance of the Lovett Heirs parcel. Um, somehow I think the uh, motion got garbled a bit. Um, and that it should say uh, that Council Rowe, uh, let's see, motion J. Rowe that the town accept the deeds. Yes. Mm -hmm. to acquire the 52.85% share, et cetera, um, from the Janet Jordan Addington. Addington Trust for the amount of, and it should be 20,000, oh. 488, not 420,000. <laughs> Significantly different. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, any other additions or changes? Okay. All in favor? Good. Okay. Let's move on to the reports and correspondence. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was invited to attend uh, the first meeting of the Sports Done Right Committee. Uh, this was co-sponsored by the school board and by the Community Services Department. The intent of Sports Done Right uh, which is a program that originated at the University of Maine at Orono, is to gain community buy-in on shared values uh, that make athletics a positive experience for Maine's youth. Uh, the goal in our town here is, is to involve both school sports programs and uh, our various youth sports programs, and we'll be hearing more about this in the coming months. Uh, the Strategic Planning Group for our Volunteer Emergency Services continues to meet and assess options uh, that are available regarding what we'll do hopefully before that night when an alarm rings and we're not able to, to put a vehicle on the road due to uh, a manpower shortage. Uh, we're approaching a critical time uh, in our volunteer uh, emergency services and we're trying to be proactive uh, in our approach there. So uh, there'll be more coming from that committee, hopefully a report by the end of the year. Um, I had the pleasure of, of greeting the newly formed Alternative Energy Committee last Tuesday. Uh, like our other boards, commissions, and committees, uh, this group is loaded with dedicated citizens who have a, a wealth of, of expertise and uh, energy. And I know that they're going to help move our town in positive ways in, in, the, in the coming months. And finally, I'd like to remind citizens that the kickoff meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Farm Committee will be held a week from this Wednesday. That's November 14th at 7 o'clock p.m. at Sprague Hall. Uh, and anyone with an interest in working for the long-term vitality and uh, viability of our, our working farms is invited to take part. Uh, this association has been a very exciting experience for me, and I very much look forward to finding out where this journey will lead us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Mary Ann. Thank you. Um, it's a good segue, Jim, for one of the things I wanted to mention, and that is that our, our um, our farms in Cape Elizabeth have about the longest growing season in the state of Maine, and um, Penny Jordan informed me of that um, late last week. Um, but Jody Jordan's farm and the William Jordan farm are both still open, their vegetable stands, and as we talk about what we can do to preserve farms if people can 
continue to buy their vegetables. And I know that um, Jody is open all year long, and um, the William Jordan Farm on um, Wells Road, I think they're planning to be open at least till Thanksgiving. Uh, and there's still fresh lettuce and tomatoes and lots of things. So I just mentioned that. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, I had the privilege of walking um, the, some of the new trails at Winnick Woods with one of the Conservation Commission members two weeks ago. And um, there's about four miles of trails that the Conservation Commission has created just this fall. And I know that they're planning a grand opening, but if anyone is looking for a place to walk, they really ought to check out uh, the Winnick Woods Trail. And there's parking on Sawyer Road. Um, so it's just a, an amazing, amazing place to walk around in. Um, I'm on the County Budget Advisory Committee, and I wanted to report back to um, the council that we had a vote last week, and um, the vote um, was adopt the budget was adopted by the Budget Advisory Commission, but I um, felt I had to vote against it, and I just wanted to explain to you my reasons why. Um, I felt um, strongly that the um, county um, executive had underestimated non-tax revenues um, fairly significantly, such that it really affected um, the bottom line of how much would have to be raised in tax revenues. Um, the surplus, the county surplus, is over seven million dollars um, on a budget of 36 million. That's about 20 percent. If you look at it as um, uh, a fraction of what's collected in taxes, which is about 20 million, you're up over 30 percent. Considering that our town surplus is in the 8 percent range, um, I could not, in good conscience, support a budget uh, carrying that kind of surplus. Um, two other reasons is that. Um, the county pays insurance premiums, and then they get refunds back for um, good incident ratings. Um, the premiums are paid by the taxpayers, but the premiums have been put into um, a fund for the premium refunds have been put into a fund for special projects. And I um, thought that to the extent that taxpayers pay the premiums, taxpayers should get the benefit of the refunds. Um, and then finally, um, the county budget is not at all transparent. Um, it's, very, it's an incredibly difficult thing to follow because they keep a lot of separate enterprise budgets um, for the federal prisoners that they take and prisoners from other counties. So um, I also didn't vote for it um, as a way to just say that I objected to the lack of transparency in the budget. Um, so I wanted to explain that to you. Um, I frankly was comfortable with the overall level of the budget. Um, it was the fact, though, that it could have been, the taxes could have been lowered if um, we had taken a different approach to surplus and um, estimated revenues. And um, I wanted to just mention two other things. Um, one is, as a resident of the Shore Road area, um, I wanted to pass on to the manager and to all the town employees who were involved. I have had many, many compliments from residents, especially in the Shore Road area, on the Shore Road um, paving project. So I just wanted to make sure I did that publicly, because I have heard from many people um, how great they think the road is. And lastly, um, I serve on the school board's wellness committee. And I wanted to announce that next Wednesday, November 15th is going to be walk or ride to school day. And I think there will be some signs around town, but I thought I would also use this opportunity just to tell the public. And I know um, I see Chief Williams here. I know they're working closely with the police force to make sure that that's a very safe day. Uh, but they're really trying to encourage physical activity by our children. So um, they've come up with this walk or ride and I would ask motorists on um, Wednesday, November 15th, to pay particular attention. Um, I'm sure everyone does anyway, but there will be more people on the roads. And the rain date is November 16th. So thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And thanks for that uh, very thorough look at the county budget. As always, you always come up with some great ideas. And 
We appreciate that very much. I would just like to remind everybody that tomorrow's election day. It's important that we get out and vote for our um, local um, town councilor as well as school board positions. And there's also some important state bond issues on the ballot. And I would encourage everyone to vote if they haven't done so already. The polls will be open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And secondly, I just want to briefly thank everyone who showed up for our um, uh, town Center Intersection Workshop, which was held last Saturday, October 27th. Um, I specifically or especially want to thank uh, Maureen O'Meara, our town planner, uh, members of the Road Safety Committee, as well as my fellow tech counselors who were there for um, moral support. Um, I also um, want to extend um, thanks to um, two local citizens who devoted their professional expertise to our workshop, Tom Emery and Patrick Carroll. Um, and of course, um, Bob Malley, um, Tom Errico, Steve Harding, um, as well as Richard Berman were all very helpful. Um, so I think it was successful, and I know the town manager is going to report on some of the details, but I just wanted to extend my sincere appreciation for everyone who came out for the workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Ann? Um, I just wanted to um, mention that I attended uh, a breakfast meeting of the Chamber, of, the Great <coughs> Portland Chamber of Commerce last Wednesday. Uh, it was a meeting of many um, business community leaders, and the principal topic was tax reform. It was a panel discussion on tax reform. And um, it's still the number one interest of um, at least the, uh, the community that they were talking about there. And they are looking for changes or support. Uh, that many people were looking for different things from the legislature, depending upon what their point of view was. But it's going to be, obviously, a big topic for the legislature. So I would urge any CAPE citizens who are interested in the topic to forward their thoughts to our counselor slash state rep, Cynthia Dill, because I'm sure she will be interested in what's on your mind. And I would also draw your attention, if you've not seen it, um, I draw your attention to the latest polling data from Critical Insights. They do a tracking poll twice a year on a variety of political um, topics and other issues, current issues. Um, and they had information on uh, sort of predictions, I guess you could say, on what was happening with the various bond issues and the other things in the election tomorrow. Um, but it continued to show that taxes and the economy are taxes number one and the economy number two are the two top um, issues of interest to Maine citizens. So it's still out there, and I'm sure we're very well aware of there are going to be uh, signatures gathered tomorrow for a Tabor 2 initiative that is being proposed, and also I, I believe uh, there are people who are going to be trying to uh, get the uh, excise tax proposal on the ballot. So I'm not sure if they'll be collecting signatures tomorrow, but people should just be aware of that. Thank you very much, Ann. David? Um, I'd like to comment on two things. One, um, I'd like to commend, I, I suppose this goes to the town manager and perhaps the town clerk and our webmaster for the information that is on the website that includes information on town council packets, present and past. I've referred to that a few times over the last few weeks, and it's a great resource, and I encourage the public to use that for information about the town council meetings. It's also enabled me to dispense with a lot of the accumulated stuff that I get for, for our council meetings, which means that our dining room table is stacked not quite as high with some of it because I can access it online, which is wonderful. So I thank the town clerk for the effort to assemble that and get it to the webmaster and get it online. So thank you. Um, it, more significantly, I'd like to comment on an art, uh, a letter to the editor that was in the Cape Courier uh, this week, which is something that I've never done publicly as part of a town council meeting. But there was an interesting letter um, in the Cape Courier from someone who suggested that the town places a premium on presenting a picture-perfect image and suggested that it was her experience that um, people who sort of expose the side of Cape Elizabeth that is less than picture perfect face hostility from um, what she described as uh, the powers that be. 
And I'd like to respond to that and just encourage that writer and anyone in the public who senses that by raising issues related to the town, um, that they feel like the powers that be, whoever that may be, whether that means elected officials or whether it be town officials, um, that they bring that matter to the town manager's attention. Um, and I am confident that the town manager will be responsive to those concerns. And if they sense that for any reason that the town council, that the town manager is not responsive, that they should contact the town councilors. Um, and our town manager reports to the town council. And I have never found um, our town manager or anybody within town hall to be anything less than fully responsive to citizens that raise concerns about town matters. Um, anyway, I found the letter to the editor, to the editor troubling. Um, my sense is that it was completely inconsistent with my experience having served four years on the council. And I simply want, wanted to invite the public to the extent that they sense that there is any issue that is not being responded to to their satisfaction or to the extent that they sense that there is some hostility by raising issues um, of town concern, that they should bring that to the town manager's attention um, or to the councilors themselves. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay. Um, actually, I appreciate you bringing that up, David. I, I had the same, exactly the same response. It, it bothered me because it was not true, number one, and because um, it implied that um, somehow we don't listen, which is not true as well. So um, what I did want to say, though, is that it's really important for the public to understand that in our town, and I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but I know in Cape Elizabeth, we really believe in full disclosure. Every citizen has access to the budget. They have access to all of the council minutes. They have access to the council emails. There's not an issue that, that a citizen can't look up or, or look into if, they're, if they are interested. On um, two occasions during every council meeting, in the beginning, and at the end of the council meeting, we have a portion of the, of the meeting that is uh, for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. So even if somebody has an issue that isn't even related to what we're discussing in, in any particular meeting, they have a right to bring it up and we'll be happy to listen. So there, should, there really is no reason for anyone to feel that the council or the town officials are not listening to their concerns. Every time we get emails on any subject, I know that we all read them. We take them into consideration when we're deliberating on what to do. So feel free to discuss any issue with any councillor or with any town official, and we will be responsive, as David mentioned. Okay. With that, we will move on to the town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just uh, wanted to mention a couple things. Uh, Councillor Dale alluded to the workshop that was held on the, the, or the charrette, whatever the term was, on the uh, town center intersection. Uh, you know, I w wasn't able to attend. I was out of town, but I, I did get an update from both Maureen O'Meara and Bob Malley today, as well as reading some of the news accounts of it and uh, speaking to a few others. Uh, and I also received a couple of emails saying the council needed a follow-up workshop. Uh, as, you know, looking forward to that workshop uh, in meeting with Maureen and Bob, uh, we looked at the different uh, sketches that were done, and both Bob and, Mar and Maureen are going to be following up, uh, particularly with Tom Errico as well as with MDOT, on looking at some of the pros and cons of the different suggestions, and particularly looking at right-of-way issues and looking at, at cost issues. Uh, this project is, is funded at 437000 I believe. Uh, any, any additional dollars are totally local cost, so any decisions that town council eventually makes, I think you, you have to have the best numbers uh, going into making those decisions. Uh, I sent an email earlier to the council suggesting a date for that, which I think we'll probably discuss at the end of the meeting, 
when we're not on camera, when we're not preparing schedules publicly, uh, which never works out too well. Uh, so, you know, but it will be posted hopefully on the website within a day or two of when that workshop might be. But the, the hope is to have information for you so then you will be in a position to decide the next steps, what, what you'd like to have looked into uh, more, more deeply, more carefully. Are there any questions on that? Did I cover it, Maureen? Anything you need, need to add? Yeah, and the, yeah, Maureen's going to be sending out notices as well uh, to the workshop with the, the letting them know the standard workshop procedures, but also letting the, the interested parties, particularly the neighbors, know uh, that this uh, workshop is going to be happening on the date that it's happening, and there'll be, you know, there'll be public notice of that. So it'll, and it probably won't be until around the end of the month or the beginning of next month uh, because of the, the length of time that it potentially will take to get this information together. Uh, secondly, I did want to mention the, speaking of road projects in the main Department of Transportation, uh, last month I reported that we were having trouble, that MDOT kept delaying the bid advertising date uh, for the Spurwick Avenue project, and Bob finally got a call, I think he said this morning, it must have been this morning, from MDOT in Scarborough saying it was due to go out to bid this Wednesday. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, and right, I have online right here the bid schedule from MDOT that they updated November 1, 2007, and it's not listed. Uh, nonetheless, the latest news as of November 5th at approximately 8, 8 a.m. is that it's due to go out to bid. Then they'll accept bids for three weeks. Uh, MDOT does that. We don't. Uh, and the, the good news is, is those bids should be in before you have the workshop in this intersection so you know because that's under the working under the same principle. If, if it comes in over bid, they're going to be looking for us to pay 100% of the, the cost over the, the project estimate. So it's important that we know that number before we, we delve and commit into other things. Uh, so hopefully the information that Bob uh, received this morning will prove to be accurate over the long term, and uh, that should be helpful. So I also asked Bob today how much the whole Shore Road project cost. It was, he, he didn't have all the bills, but it, it was about a little under 250000 and that was just for, you know, a, a little bit of uh, work, you know, compared to what's going on in Spurwing. So it really gives you the sense of, you know, he was talking like the hand work at the end of driveways that used to be $75, uh, was it a yard or a ton, uh, is now up to 125 and that's just in a year. So it gives you the sense of some of the inflation in that area and why, why I have a particular sensitivity right now about these bids and, you know, the desire to get these numbers as soon as we can. Any questions on that? I was asked a question whether or not the um, total cost of the shore road paving was picked up by the town, and I believe it was, but I wanted to just confirm that. It was 100 percent locally funded. Thank you. I, I have one question, too. Oh, go ahead. Michael, um, if the bids do come in high on Spurwink, uh, you, you said, you know, 100 percent of the excess would be um, locally funded if we were going to go ahead and do it. Is there also the potential for altering the scope of the project? In other words, instead of the scope staying the same and the cost being more, could it be the cost stays the same and the scope is reduced or something in between those two? Whenever bids come in high, we always look at that. Okay. The, 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 the trouble, you know, the difficulty with Spurwink, it's in just such bad shape. I know, it's a wreck. You want to make sure if you make an investment in it that you do it right. Okay. Uh, Thank but, you. Uh, and I presume we'll have some of this information in writing before the workshop. Ho hopefully. I, that's the plan. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> MDOT posts their, their bids on online for the, the benefit of contractors, so I'm hoping that, you know, as members of the public, we can, all, we can also get access to that information. Okay. Thank you. We just haven't found communication with MDOT. Uh, uh, we'll work on it. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Ann. Okay. We will move on to uh, the next item, which is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. So are there any citizens that would like to bring anything to the Council's attention that is any items that are not on the agenda? We will move to item number 135. Would someone like to make a motion? I would move to remove item 135 from the table. Second. 
Okay, all in favor? Yes. Okay, now, would someone like to make a motion um, regarding item 135? Not me. Yeah. I, I have a question first, um, and I just wanted to make sure um, my, it's a point of information. Is this the same? Uh, there are no changes between this and what we saw. I'm looking at Maureen. Why don't we Listen. ask um, Maureen, our town planner? I thought Maureen, for the sake of the public who might not have seen the previous yeah. meeting, Maureen, on could this, you fill us in on this one, please? A brief recap might be helpful. What you're asked to consider is adopting a community fee utilization plan for the Trowbrook watershed. And uh, I've got two maps up here. This one right here shows you Trowbrook. Because there's been a lot of emails and confusion, I put this one up. This is the map that is in the comprehensive plan. And as you see, there are orange lines and blue lines. All whole towns in a watershed. And this right here is the Trout Brook watershed. Obviously, there are, there are other watersheds in town as well. Everything's in a watershed somewhere. The Trout Brook watershed does not comply with the water quality standards, the water quality classifications of the DEP. It's a water quality classification B in Cape Elizabeth. It's C in South Portland. And uh, we're not quite meeting those water quality standards. So it's been designated an urban impaired watershed. And what that means is that any project that triggers the state site location law will be required to meet impaired uh, watershed standards in addition to the regular site location standards. Uh, those standards typically require projects to um, mitigate their impact, their, their stormwater impact on the watershed. Uh, usually what developments will do is they'll do their best to mitigate it on site Often they won't be able to do all of the work on site and they look for an off site project to, um, to do something in the watershed that will reduce impervious surface or, or otherwise improve the overall water quality. If a community adopts a CFOP, then the projects that the developer picks from are identified by the town because the town gives the developer an opportunity to pay a fee instead of going and putting in a, a mitigation project somewhere else. Uh, so this gives the town the opportunity to collect a fee, to let the money ag aggregate until you can, you can work on a project that you've identified. And uh, Councillor swift Kayata asked if there are changes. There are changes from what you saw in, you, you originally submitted this in August. You had a public hearing in September and you tabled it tonight to tonight. Between September and tonight, uh, I had met with members of the DEP and we went over the, the whole plan. They made a few procedural, procedural changes, which I didn't think were significant, and those are shown in your document tonight. They also went over the projects, which is where I expected to see a significant amount of changes. And we only need a couple of projects to make this a viable uh, community plan. And so we talked about that at length. Um, I've made what I consider to be all the changes that they've asked for. I'm happy to go through the projects one by one. Uh, I talked to one of the members of the DEP today because I haven't gotten a letter yet that says, yes, we like your proposed plan. We're ready to approve it. They, they're happy with it. Um, they're willing to go two different ways. One would be to, to basically conditionally approve it and whenever we have a project, we'd go back to just double check we're on track. The other part would be they'd like to come down and, and, and walk the watershed and actually put more detail in the plan. And I said, as far as I'm concerned, either one's fine with me as long as you know, the ultimate answer is yes. So that's where we are with that right now. But the changes in here are changes that were intended to fine tune it to meet the DP standards. Um, and it, actually, I consider the changes to be good ones. Um, there, was, there was actually a project we had talked about early on where we might be able to collect some of the money and use it to buy conservation easements, um, which is you know, a way to preserve open space so that it won't be developed. And initially, the DEP was very opposed to that because they really want to look at mitigation, taking an area that's degraded and making it better. But in one instance in Cape Elizabeth where we have a portion of the brook that is in an area where we think there are 
things entering the brook and we don't have much of a buffer, they've agreed that that might be a good place where we could actually purchase a conservation easement along the edge of Trout Brook, which would be a nice opportunity to work that in as part of a bigger program for open space preservation. So that's something they had initially you know, stepped away from and are now saying they're willing to look at that and spend the money on that. But I'm, I'm happy to go over the other projects in detail if you want those. Okay. Who, and who could I just ask a couple of questions? Please. Um, so I know we're talking sort of about two different items here at the same time because they're interlinked, but uh, I just want to confirm my understanding on the Trout Brook watershed uh, CFUP, the Community Fee Utilization Fund. Um, if, if we as a community have one of these utilization plans, if we accept this, then we get to, we as a town get to identify the projects and put the fee money towards the projects that we prioritize, right? right? But, but the if, projects but have to the, be the ones that are listed in this plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but Otherwise, if we don't have our own utilization plan, the project, any project proposed in that area could still be approved, but there would be a mitigation project um, perhaps designed by the developer. In other words, it wouldn't be necessarily our list of projects. It could be some other project. And then that's one thing. So that's correct. Right. And, and the key piece there is that um, you know, if you're a developer and you're looking for a mitigation project, like, you know, most developers, they're trying to minimize risk. So they're going to go towards the easiest mitigation project they can find. And for this watershed, there's a high likelihood that the easiest mitigation project is retrofitting some parking lots in South Portland. So since the watershed extends over to South Portland, the, any mitigation project could likely be over in South Portland yes. and not benefiting our side of the line. That's right. Sincerely. Okay, that was one thing I wanted to make sure. And then the, the stormwater improvement fee mm -hmm. is basically to sort of balance off the impact. It has to do with the comprehensive plan so that um, since that uh, watershed, projects in that watershed basically overlap with some of the growth uh, areas designated in our new comp plan that um, it would tend to sort of distort the intent of the uh, comp plan. So the stormwater improvement fee is basically a fee to sort of equalize it. So across all of Cape Elizabeth, it isn't, it isn't pointing the development towards one place or another. That's right. Correct? That's right. And then my last question is, so what's your professional recommendation on each of these? Um, I would recommend you adopt both of them. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Anybody else? Mary Ann? Um, a couple of questions, Maureen. Um, you mentioned that a fee, the fee could be used to purchase a conservation easement. Um, what's the setback from Trout Brook? Is that 75 feet? Right, yes. And um, what would a conservation easement do that the setback doesn't already do? What it would do is it would give us uh, proactive opportunities to go in and restore a buffer, whereas the shoreland zoning 75-foot setback is something that really only has an impact when someone wants to do something to change what's already there. If you don't have much of a buffer now and you're not doing anything to increase the buffer, you're still not in violation of the shoreland zoning. Okay. And. Um and you may have mentioned this, and I apologize if you did, that uh, Maine DEP sets the fee in Trout Brook. Do we have any sense of um, how the level of that fee would compare to the um, stormwater improvement <coughs> fee? I would, this, the, the fee schedule is not just for Trout Brook, it's statewide. Any urban impaired watershed has to meet this fee schedule. And the recommendation is that we use the exact same, same okay. fee schedule for the stormwater fee. Great. And uh, just one final question, sure. if I may. Um, as far as I know, there's one pending development in the Trout Brook area. Do you have a sense of what that fee would be based on 
let's just say based on current plans? I can tell you that the, those plans are changing as we speak. Um, but the last time I spoke with the developer, they were looking around the $19,000 range. For the entire development? Right. Okay. Thank you. I have a question about the prioritization of projects in mm -hmm. the um, up. Yep. <clears throat> I think I read that the projects would be done in accordance with our adopting this program would mean we're essentially giving our endorsement to the priority. Does that mean that the first $10,000 has to be spent on collecting data? In other words, are we locked into the priority? Yeah, I don't, I think that if we had another way to go and we went to DEP, their, their approach with us has been that they're very willing to work with us. This is not the most severely degraded watershed in Maine. It's really one of the better quality ones and we're, we're taking the initiative to try to do the right thing and they've been fairly open with, to us with what we've talked about. So, you know, if for example, um, we had a real opportunity to go with the conservation easement and that was number three, my sense is that DEP would say, yes, you can put the money into that one. I mean, their, their big thing is they want to see a real improvement in the watershed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any, any other? Sarah? Would the fees from both of them be pulled into one big fund? I wouldn't do that because the fees from the CFUP are regulated by this plan that the DEP has approved. And when we spend the money, we're going to have to make sure we meet this plan and we will make sure they're on board with us. You could spend, I would keep the funds separate because the local stormwater fee is, is complete town discretion on how you spend it. That doesn't mean that the town couldn't say, we think this conservation easement is such a great idea, we're going to take all the money out of the Trout Brook Fund and spend it, and we're going to take all our money out of our stormwater fund and put it into the same project. So it doesn't prohibit you from, from pooling the money in, in one project, but I would still keep the funds physically separate in two different accounts. And how do you envision that <clears throat> that, that would be decided? The stormwater improvement monies, how would they, how, who would choose where, what projects they should go to? Who would choose? I would see that as a council decision. I mean, we don't have any money in there yet. I mean, and I, I point to the manager to see how he would handle it, but my expectation is that the project came forward, paid the fee, it was sitting in the account. You would then get a proposal from staff as to what to spend the money on. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Can you just, just, can you just briefly explain the terms you use? What's a watershed, and what's a buffer, and sure. what's wrong with stormwater that needs to be improved? Sure, that's fine. Um, a watershed is basically all of the physical in the drains to one water body, which is a collection point. So if you think of the landscape as having hills and valleys, everything drains somewhere. And where you have the peaks of the hills is where you have the watershed breaks. The peak of the hills here, the water flows this way or it flows that way. And this map gives you an idea, for example, this shows you, if you use Great Pond as an example, that all the water that collects in Great Pond <coughs> comes off of Fowler Road, comes down this point of, of Bowery Beach toward Great Pond, and then it outlets through a brook. So a watershed is the, is the area that the, that water body drains, drains from. Mr. It's equivalent to the Continental Divide that well, runs down is, yeah. Colorado, everything on to the west of it goes to the Pacific, everything to the east goes into the Atlantic. And right. Gulf. So when we talk about preserving significant natural resources, a watershed isn't necessarily a significant natural resource because every place is in a watershed. Uh, so what we're talking about here is that some watersheds, what the state has done, and it's coming out of the federal government too, is we're starting to say some watersheds have traumatic water quality issues. And, you know, we're, we're kind of like on the least traumatic up here. If you look at this, the, the data that we do have for Trout Brook, in a lot of cases, it's just missing the standard for the water quality classification it, it, it's in. I don't know if anyone's heard some of the, there was a lot of coverage, I think, last month about Long Creek in South Portland and the meeting with the DEP. Mm -hmm. Long Creek is an urban impaired watershed. And that is one that's on the DEP's priority list because it has significant issues. So, you know, watersheds, Trout Brook, and then our third, the third question was, why do we care about stormwater? 
Well, um, storm water is, you know, it rains, the water falls on the ground. If you have a meadow, if you have a forested area, most of the water that falls on the ground is absorbed by the plants and the trees and it percolates into the soil. If you have a parking lot, almost none of the water gets absorbed. It all runs off to some collection point. And when it runs off, it washes everything that's on the pavement with it. So people who've parked their cars there, you know, the, the, the nasty little drips of oil and the particulates and things that settle off of the air all get collected into the storm water. So what was, you know, a perfectly nice rainstorm then turns into a great washing point where you have lots of things in your storm water. The cheapest way, and storm water has things in it, and how you clean it depends on what's in it. But one of the cheapest ways to clean stormwater is to create what we call a vegetated buffer. That's when you take a large strip of land, you put natural vegetation in it. That means not lawns, but your typical you know, meadows, forests, and you let the water run through it. And what happens is as the water runs through it, the plants absorb a lot of the pollutants, the water filters through into the ground, it tends to cleanse the water. So what you have is the effluent on the other end is in pretty good shape. And it's very efficient, it's very effective, and it's really very cheap. If you look at some of the other options, you'll hear about lakes that have phosphorus problems. The, the expense that the towns go through and, and state, the state goes through to try to clean phosphorus out of water by creating settling ponds. And, and the success is sometimes great and sometimes not so good at all. So, a vegetative buffer strip is the best way to protect natural resources and to clean water. And Cape Elizabeth is a leader in vegetative buffer strips. You require, along all these green areas, 250 foot wide buffer strips of natural vegetation. You let very little happen in that 250 foot area. The lighter green areas, you don't require a 250 foot wide buffer strip, but you do require a buffer strip when someone's going in to alter the wetland and they go to the planning board and the planning board establishes a buffer. So that's why the buffer strips are important. So when you say you're going to use the fees to buy conservation land and make, you're saying you're going to make buffers, you're going to buy some land and let it be natural so it filters. Thank you. David. We're obviously combining our discussion here on two agenda items, okay. right? Yes. Yeah, we have to. They're, yes. they're, they're related. <laughs> so if we adopt the community fee utilization plan, what makes you confident that a developer is going to opt to pay the fee as opposed to mitigate somewhere? Well, there, it's possible a developer may say, you know, I, I really do want to go do a project somewhere else, but again, most developers always try to minimize the risk. And a fee that they can calculate at the onset is a, a, a known quantity versus having to go out somewhere in the watershed, find a project that is roughly equivalent to what they would pay for the fee anyway. In some cases, they're, they're not working on public land. They're working on private property, so they have to get the permission of the private property owner. There's a lot more risk and unknown in that kind of procedure than to just come to the town and say, here's a check. That's why I think most developers would much prefer to just pay the fee. And I've spoken with at least one developer who said they much prefer to just pay the fee. But just so we're clear on that, there's no obligation for them to pay the fee. It's, no. a, it's entirely optional. No, they can still go ahead and, and, I mean, most developers are going to try first to mitigate on the site. And if they can do it all on the site, that's what they'll do. But the reality is they almost never can do that. That's why they need to look at some other options. But they'll have the option to mitigate on site, mitigate off site, or pay the fee. That's right. And that choice is up to the developer under the circumstance. Yes. Okay. okay. Anybody else? I just said something before she left the podium. Okay. Before Mar Maureen leaves the podium, I, I don't know if any of you noted, but this is the first use uh, of the new podium. Uh, at, at a town council meeting, and uh, <laughs> Very good. I think it, it's, it's nice that Maureen is the one using it for the first time at a council meeting because uh, Maureen was the one that was advocating for the new podium so that there was a nice flat surface for folks to work. <laughs> uh, and she also then worked uh, particularly with Bob McMain, who works in the facilities department, employee of the school department, and he constructed uh, that whole podium. So that was constructed 
uh, by, by Bob and just did an excellent job. Maureen consulted on some of the details of it, but in the end it was, it was really Bob's detailing. So I, I want to use the opportunity to acknowledge the new podium, to thank Maureen, and particularly to thank uh, Bob for his uh, work in putting it together. So. Thank you, Michael. That's, that's cool. great. It does look very, very nice. So. Thanks. thanks, Maureen, for your help, and thanks, Bob, for holding it. Maureen, I, I do have a couple of just quick questions. I think they've been said, but I want to sort of summarize just so the, the audience really understands this. Number one, uh, fees that are collected do not go into the general fund. They go into their own account, correct? Okay. The projects that are going to be carried out, whatever they are, are DE, DEP approved projects that benefit the environment. The, the, the CFUP would be DEP approved projects. Okay. The stormwater fee would, would be, be town local project. projects. Yeah. But the idea is that all of the projects, the purpose of the projects is to create environmental um, improvements, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. the, fees, the fees that are collected would be the fees that would be used to fund these projects. And the next question, or the final question, really is just, um, it seems to me that we really need both of these to work in concert with one another. And that, that's how it would work best. Is that accurate? Yeah, the, the advantage of the local fee is it, it helps maintain your existing land use policies. Okay. It, it establishes, reestablishes that level playing field. OK. That's right, Kat. Very good. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Can I ask one more question? Oh, sure. How, can you just go over again? How did you establish the fees? How did you decide the level of the price? Well, that's the and best why not part. higher? <laughs> I didn't have to do that. Uh, the state the state establishes the fee. They established the fee system, and you know it's it's it is what it is. And all we're doing is saying you know we're, we don't have any choice on the Trout Brook watershed. We're saying if we're going to establish equilibrium by adopting a local fee, it needs to be the same amount. Thank you. Good. Uh, David. And w one other question. Shift, I I'm going to jump from the agenda item 136, which I had asked about in my previous question, to 135, which is the one that is almost before us, although nobody's made a motion for almost. it yet. <laughs> um, for the Trout, Book, Trout Brook watershed, my understanding from the last time this was before us a couple of months ago, that we satisfied ourselves that there is enough undeveloped land in the RB and RC districts that are outside the Trout Brook watershed to be able to accommodate the 300 plus contemplated additional new homes that could be built in Cape Elizabeth over the next 10 yes. plus years, correct? In my opinion, yes, there is. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that my recollection of that was correct mm -hmm. a couple months ago. All right. Okay. Thank well, you. All set. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, we all set with Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to motion. make a motion for item 135? Yes. For item 135, um, I'd move that we adopt the stormwater improvement fee plan as proposed in the memo from the town planner dated July 31, 2007. Would someone like to make a second? Second the motion. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Any discussion? David? Um, I know we've talked about both of them um, as a package, but I am inclined to not support 135, uh, but to support 136 uh, when we get to it. Um, it I, I haven't quite bought into the notion of creating a fee that will sort of be an overlay on the in every part of town other than the Trout Brook watershed just to balance the fact that the state is mandating a fee within the Trout Brook watershed. Um, I, I don't like the idea of creating a new tax or a new fee, whatever you want to call it, 
on landowners who want to develop their property um, unless there's an independent, standalone rationale for that fee or tax. And I don't see this as an independent rationale that stands alone. Mm -hmm. It can't be separated from the fact that there's a fee that will exist on developers within the trout park watershed. Um, and um, the fact that we seem to have enough land within the RBNRC districts outside the Trout Brook watershed to accommodate the additional growth we're contemplating over the next decade plus, um, in my mind, um, doesn't create a compelling reason to impose this additional burden on developers throughout town. So for those reasons, um, I will not be supporting uh, the motion on agenda item 135. Um, I, I think it's um, true that on this issue in particular, reasonable people can disagree on this one. And I, I understand Councillor Backer's point of view, but I do disagree. Um, after two years of working on the Comprehensive Plan Committee um, and going through all the discussions over those two years about where growth and development should, the growth and development that will naturally occur um, should occur. I think it's um, the growth areas that have been in existence for the past, since 1993 are the same growth areas that were proposed, that have been proposed and are being, going to be in the new comprehensive plan. And I, I'm afraid that if we don't do both of these, 135 and 136, um, at the same time, my judgment comes out a little different from, from David. Uh, I think that it would provide an incentive for developers who did want to develop somewhere in Cape Elizabeth, some piece of property, to, it would be a little bit cheaper for them to develop in the non-Trout Brook area, which is the gr a growth area, and I think it would have the impact of pushing somewhat the development towards what have, has areas that have not been designated as growth areas in the comprehensive plan. And I think one reason that Cape is such a great community and that we have uh, such high satisfaction amongst our citizens as evidenced by the, the survey that was done a year and a half or two years ago for the comprehensive plan committee is that people like the way that development has been directed or not directed to various areas of the town. And so I respectfully come out to a different conclusion than, than David on this one, and I will be supporting both of these because I think it equalizes it and it will um, allow the comprehensive plan to work as it has successfully, the previous, ver the, the current version, and then also the new version to continue working the way it has since 1993. So, so that's where I come up. Okay. I've, I've struggled with this one. Um, philosophically, I don't particularly care for impact fees, mm -hmm. and this is an impact fee. And if I can use an example, um, and there are a number of places, particularly in the south and the west, where there's a lot of development, where developers are charged school impact fees. And what happens is a developer builds a new three bedroom house and is charged an impact fee based on that. Because the idea is they'll sell it to someone and it will cause additional um, demand on the schools. Now, someone can sell an existing four bedroom home. Empty nesters can sell a four bedroom home to a family with children. And there is as much of an impact but there is no impact fee because it's an existing home. So for that reason, I generally don't like what I perceive as a, a price distortion that doesn't always make sense. And that's why I've generally not liked impact fees. However, as I th thought about this a lot today because I really still listening to everyone uh, who came to the last meeting and, and what David had to say, um, 
I struggled today with all the things we heard about last week, and I guess I've come to the conclusion that this is a case where new development is adding impervious surface, um, that there is an incremental um, decrease, potentially, in water quality um, just because of the addition of impervious surface. So I guess I've been able in my own mind to distinguish it from some of the major flaws that I see in impact fees generally and um, will be supporting it. However, I would like to put in a plea to the manager and even to the council. I still think, for instance, using the impact fee to fund street sweeping programs is not particularly fair to the newcomers because all of us contribute to street sweeping needs. So I will support it because I think using funds for things like stormwater drainage improvements makes sense and is fair. But I and I, I won't withhold my vote, but I would like you to really rethink um, the proposal that it also be used for just the ongoing street sweeping, because I don't think that's particularly fair. So I will be supporting um, both, but it's not without a lot of anguish over whether I'm sliding down the slippery slope of impact fees. <laughs> Jim? Yeah, I, I don't have the same aversion to impact fees. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't consider them to be taxes uh, because it's, it's totally optional going in. You know what the deal is going in. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. And I think a tax, to me anyway, is something that is imposed upon you regardless of how you feel. So I don't consider that a, a, a drawback to this. But I, I will support both uh, 135 and 136. Okay. Anybody else? I, I, um, I appreciate what David said. I, it makes a lot of sense from the standpoint of um, fairness in terms of um, an adverse impact on, a, on somebody in another part of town. However, I think that the overriding need to uh, dir successfully direct modest growth in the, in the correct areas of town lead me to the conclusion that this is a good thing, a good um, item to adopt. And in our letter that was uh, sent uh, in, support, in support of the information here, you know, basically what it says is local land use policies are now undermined by the designation of Trout Brook as an urban impaired watershed. And what that means, of course, is it's pushing growth to other parts of town. And the adoption of a local stormwater improvement fee could neutralize this policy conflict. I agree with that logic, and that's why I will be supporting this measure. So with that, yeah, I, yes, Michael. I just want to say something I held off saying because I didn't want to influence the debate. I, I just wanted to be, have everyone be clear that this is not the first example of us having a system like this. We also have one in the recreation and open space sections of the zoning ordinance with is a similar, you know, provide land or, or pay a fee, uh, and also in some of the affordable housing provisions as well uh, within our ordinance. So that this is, you know, I, I wouldn't want it reported that this is the first instance of uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, utilizing a system like this. Thank you. Thanks. For Can I say one thing? And I don't think it necessarily, I plan to vote for it too, but not because it contains growth within the high growth area, because I feel a little ambivalent about managing or growth. For me, it's an environmental issue. It's raising much needed funds to try to mitigate the, the adverse effects of essentially building and development, putting in parking lots, putting in roofs, putting in lawns. So I, I, my vote is for the environment rather than managing growth, just to go on record. That's fine. Okay. All in favor? Okay. All opposed? Okay. David. Yeah. Yeah, it still needs to come up. David. Okay. Oh, it does. Okay. Very good. Okay. Item 136, we need to take that off the table. Uh, move that it be removed from the table. Second. All in favor? 
it is off the table. Do we have a motion for that item? Ann? Um, I will move uh, that we adopt the Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan as proposed in a memo from the town planner dated August 1st, 2007. And second. And as amended. And, and as amended? Well, as amended in the memo dated October 31st. Uh, hang on one sec. Yes, and as, a, thank you. And as yes. amended um, in the memo dated October 31st. Okay, very good. Thanks, Is yes. there a second on that? Second. Um, any discussion? All, all in favor? Okay. Uh, okay, and, and I just will say, uh, Sarah, just as to your comment, these are, I'm, I'm too supporting the environment. These are both very envir environmentally friendly measures, so thanks for that. Okay, item number 151. Would someone like to make a motion? Why don't we have one for the other one for table? Okay, I would move. Um, I would move um, that uh, that uh, we accept um, the request to change the name of the northerly end of Shipwreck Cove Road back to the origi original Peebles Cove Road. And the effect would be to change numbers 21, 26, and 28 Shipwreck Cove Road um, to newly assigned numbers on Peebles Cove. Second. Thank you, Cynthia. Any discussion? The chief is here if you have any questions. He came out for this purpose this evening. Okay. Well, thanks, chief. Well, let's send him home let's early. Let's let him clear. use the new code. All in favor? Oh, did you have a I was going to ask a question, oh, if I may. Although it's, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, but go ahead. Dave. I don't have any problem with the name change. Yes. Um, but I'm curious, Chief Williams, if you don't mind, and, and thank you very much for the letter that you provided. Sure. Um, the, um, the letter of Curly it suggests that um, you're in agreement with the name change. Myself and the fire chief. Um, and that you, it, it appears from your letter that um, it's your opinion that it's in the interest of public safety to have the name change. That's correct. And I didn't quite understand what the public safety issue or concern was with this, with the, the name of the road itself. The concern is, is that Shipwreck Cove Road services uh, over 11 houses. Three of, three of those are on one side of a rock wall that goes between the road or across the road, if, if you would. Say we get a call for an ambulance call down at Shipwreck Cove Road. If the officers and the rescue go to the wrong side of the rock wall, they then have to go all the way around to the other side. And in the interest of public safety, that's not a good thing. I, I agree, that's not a good thing. That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying what should have been obvious to me when I read it. That's all right. That's it. Thanks, Chief. Okay, sorry about that, David. I yeah, no, I apologize. I should have been quicker on the draw and raising my hand when you again. asked for questions. All in favor? <laughs> okay, we're good. Now we're in order. Thanks. No, that's fine. That's good. Good question. Okay, item number 152. Who would like to? motion I would move that uh, we uh, accept the request to name the tributary of the Spurwink River as the Dyer Brook okay. as more fully set forth in our package second the motion second any discussion yes um, I appreciated the information that uh, we were provided in the packet, although on the last page there appears to be a map, and I couldn't for the life of me find where the Dyer Brook is. And I was just wondering if anybody knew. Maury. <laughs> She's not here. She's left. We have a big map. Maybe what must have happened is it, it didn't photocopy. We, didn't have a, we don't have a color photocopier. 
but it's uh, up near. Uh, well, it's apparently on Jimmy Cox's farm. It's right. right. It, well, it actually stretches so. through there and eventually goes to the the uh, front fork. Where's the Winnick Wood River? Winnick Wood River. Winnick Wood? It's in that general yeah. vicinity. Is it, is it right in the middle of the map where that little cross is? See, right in the very middle? Oh, yeah. X marks the spot? That would X be marks. In, yeah. That would be about the right. Fortunately, the, in the, the original photocopy that we got, it shows better than in this color one. I would like to, if I may, I yeah. just would like to also say that uh, this may be, um, we just had two actions consistent with the comprehensive plan. One of the recommendations in the comprehensive plan was to name unnamed bodies of water with the hope that that would give townspeople a greater appreciation mm -hmm. for the body of water. We talked in the comprehensive plan about certain ponds that had no name, um, certain brooks. So I found this really exciting that um, this actually was coming from a citizen um, who'd done some historic research and um, had a great proposal. So. It's a small thing, but I really do think people appreciate something more if they can put a name and a place to it. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Okay. All in favor? Excellent. All right. Just to, to help out, it does say that the proponent currently owns land on the stream and reports that his house is the oldest remaining house in Cape Elizabeth. So it is, it's That's by his son, it Jay Cox's property. On, mm -hmm. on Sparwick, it's probably that little one that runs under there. Oh, that's pretty mm -hmm. the oldest house in here. Um, okay, now we move to item number 153. And Jay, would you like to uh, come up and introduce that? Uh, 153? <laughs> Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee. You caught me unaware. I was here as a witness. <laughs> um, uh, you have in your packet the uh, text of the um, proposed charge that the manager has prepared. Uh, the manager um, spoke with me and um, uh, I think uh, got a sense of what uh, current planning protocols in uh, libraries entail and um, derived a, a charge document from those. Um, we're, I think, um, at the end of a, a fairly long process to come to this point. Um, and uh, the trustees of the library are deeply grateful uh, to the attention um, that the council and the comprehensive planning committee have um, paid to our um, um, comments and to our um, concerns that the, the library has approached the end of its um, useful life in terms of its current space allocation and um, uh, configurations. And we are deeply appreciative that the council would consider on this particular motion tonight um, and that the council would place its trust in the Board of Trustees um, to act as the core of a study committee um, to work with concerned citizens and uh, shareholders in the community um, to derive a, a programmatic uh, statement for what the library um, will need um, to meet the needs of the citizenry for the next 30 years and to derive a design concept utilizing to the greatest possible extent um, the current facilities and uh, allocation of um, land that the town has uh, through purchase and uh, uh, setting aside made available for library use in the community uh, and ultimately to give you um, a design uh, programmatic design um, that would put you in a position to better decide how to move forward um, to make sure that the citizens uh, have adequate space to provide not just for library services as they are currently uh, known and entertained within the community 
to provide the type of flexibility um, that we need in a changing environment of environmental services and archival purposes, uh, and also to make available the space that even in the current um, situation is no longer available to us to uh, provide services that the citizens want presently. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Once again, I want to thank Manager McGovern um, you know, for his support and for the excellent uh, work that he did in preparing this document for you. And uh, Jay, you, you did mention service. that my reference to the Cape Elizabeth Preservation Society is inappropriate. Right. Um, one of the, the things, so much is in the air at the moment within the, the library community. Um, but one of the things that we are certain of, because you know, one of the best ways to study the future is to study the present. And one of the things that has become a critical um, service and need point in the culture as it stands today is the need to maintain and preserve the past. And one of the things that is increasingly becoming problematic uh, within our nation is holding on to our archives. And we have had, despite the fact that, you know, the popular wisdom would have it that um, historical societies and libraries should not work together because sooner or later the marriage breaks over the question of space. Um, but we have had a unique experience, or perhaps not unique, but relatively rare experience within this community, that we have um, two groups um, cohabiting in the same building um, to a positive effect. And moreover, in a, in a kind of interesting sidebar to the one town concept in this community, we have an interesting situation where in fact a private group is undertaking work on behalf of the town as part of a quid pro quo for space. And in fact, in many ways, the Historical Society, Historical Preservation Society, to speak more accurately, um, does in fact function for the town of Cape Elizabeth as an archive. Um, as we move down the road, you know, I anticipate that the time will come when we will have to actually look at formal archivist services uh, for the community. Um, but one of the most critical needs that we're seeing certainly at the present is um, the maintenance of, of those documents in, in controlled conditions. Um, the name of that private group is? The Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society. Thank you. Okay. okay. Excellent. Jay had pointed out as a good librarian uh, <laughs> points out that I had it wrong at the draft. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jay. You're Thanks very welcome. You're amazing. Yeah. I'd like to move that um, the uh, a, a Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee be created consisting of, uh, as laid out in this uh, item number 153 uh, in our packet. Uh, the committee would be charged with preparing a library needs assessment and a plan to identify the, to address the identified needs. Okay, we have a second. Cynthia, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Let's move on to one item number 154. Make a motion. Anybody? Cynthia. I would move that we adopt the uh, annual amendments to the general assistance ordinance as proposed by the Maine Municipal Association. Second. Well, any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Item number 155, Manager McGovern, would you like to uh, introduce us? Just very briefly, I, not, not any detail, but the council can do that. The town council asks for a report every so often uh, on how you're doing for your goals for the year, and uh, this is a report that, uh, an update as of a, actually written a few weeks ago, even though it's dated uh, today, but uh, as you can see, uh, tremendous progress has been made, and I'd be happy to answer questions on any of the goals or if any of the counselors wish to amplify on any of the specifics of it, uh, that would also be fine. Um, yes, Anne, I, I just have a question. Sure. Um, 
Mike, I presume that this document is online as part of the council packet. I just yes, thought it, it was very interesting information that should be available to the citizens. So anybody wants to see how we're doing on our goals could look at this. On the home page of capelizabeth.com, there is a link to town council packets that Councillor Back mentioned earlier in this document is there. Okay. Thank you. Do you need a motion on this? Sure. I would move that we acknowledge receipt of the report on the status of the Town Council's 2007 goals as presented by the manager. Second. David. Any discussion? I just want to briefly thank the manager. I just find um, this particular report extremely helpful and inspiring to <laughs> know that progress is being made. So thank you very much. I, I too would like to thank the manager and I'd like to thank the staff as well. Uh, what we did is we set, the council set 12 goals with various objectives at the beginning of uh, the last council year and we have made tremendous progress. The town has made tremendous progress um, on every one of us. Some are more complete than others, but uh, really terrific progress. So thank you to you, Michael, and your entire staff. As long as we're at a mutual admiration society <laughs> this evening, you know, these are the council's goals. The council set forth and uh, you know, if you look through them, particularly the fiscal ones, there's a lot of councillors' names mentioned in terms of uh, councillors that, that have done different things. The Appointments Committee, the, the second goal, uh, again, councillors have done most of that work. Uh, you work cooperatively with citizens on the trails. You, you, you took the time to meet with the Recycling Committee. Uh, you, set, you set up a committee on alternative energy. Uh, the landscape plan, the council hasn't done too much work yet on, but you authorized it to happen and uh, it's ready for your review when you review other things. Uh, Cynthia chaired the traffic calming committee and uh, you know there's been a, an awful lot that's happened there. The traffic light we're waiting for, uh, you, want, you know, go utilize extensive citizen input. The council helped uh, the three or four of you were at that uh, that function on, I, I don't know what to call that thing. The design workshop back on October 27th. Uh, the comprehensive plan was adopted. All of you spent tons of time on that. Uh, Fort Williams, you met with the Fort Williams committee to ask for different reports. Uh, and you know, the other things that we're still working on credit cards, uh, the sewer rehab project you, you supported. Jim Rowe has been going uh, to the fire department uh, uh, looking at their future needs, they're going to meet meeting again on the 8th. You just did E, you a process to review space needs of the Thomas Memorial Library uh, in, the, in your previous action, and you also approved money in the bond issue for the Spurwing Church. So, uh, and finally, the, the one that we're still waiting for at the end is a, a Conservation Commission report on stewardship needs. So, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the, the the, what you said about the staff, but these really have been council driven. And I, you know, I've, I've worked for uh, a lot of councils over the years, and a lot of you over the years, but I don't think a, a single council has never been as devoted to the goals as this particular council has been. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the truth. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a motion, we have a second. Um, so what are we voting All just to accept? Uh, we're, we're we're acknowledge and receive. the report. To receive the report. <laughs> Thank you. 156, item 156 AM. I'd like to move that we schedule a public hearing on the cable television franchise renewal for the December 10th, 2007 town council meeting. Um, and this is the franchise agreement with Time Warner. Second. David. Any discussion? Just, there will be a few minor amendments to it next month, but more legalistic. The town attorneys reviewed it and had a few comments which I've sent on to Time Warner Cable for them to look at and suggest that they, they react positively to the comments of our attorneys. So uh, there's still a few issues to be worked out, but this is the, the basic framework. So, Michael, the process is we will have the public hearing, and then do we, are we voting on it? The plan would be you authorize. Uh, the town manager to sign it, yeah. Okay, thank you. When does the present contract terminate? You know, we've gone back and forth on that. I think it's February. Okay. Uh, so and yeah, and, and that's not, you know, I, I believe it's 
February based on something and the other thing. But, you know, I, I want to make clear there's no great hurry on this. You know, you don't need to feel as though you're under the gun to do it. There's other communities where it's expired and the services still continue. So. For obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time Warner's making a lot of money. Although they, they, the CEO did quit today, so. Well, okay, so all in favor of this motion. Okay, thank you. Okay, item number 157. Who would like to open this one up? Yeah. <laughs> I seem to be the one tonight who's getting all these miscellaneous items, but <laughs> um, I would like to uh, propose that the count to move that the council approve the pole lo the tel I guess it's called the telephone pole telephone pole location on Trundy Road um, from approximately 247 feet southwesterly of Reef Road. And this is for one poll as requested by Verizon. And this is as laid out in our packet more clearly. Hey, we have a second. Second. Sarah? Okay. Any discussion? David? Um, I trust there has been some opportunity for the affected property owner to comment on this. It's usually in the public way that the poll is located, if I may. Go ahead. Well, the poll's usually located in the public way, and um, if it's located on private property, then generally the utility would deal directly with the private property owner and seek an easement from the private property owner. But uh, yeah, I, I, I will, because <laughs> David raised the issue. Uh, we had a department head meeting today, and I asked Bob Malley, Bruce Smith, Maureen O'Mara, and no one knows why this is being requested. Usually, when one of these comes forward, we, we know why it's being requested. In this instance, we don't. Uh, I did not have a chance to, to speak to Stephen Pauliot today, uh, but what I will do if you authorize this, my, my guess is that the resident themselves asked for it, uh, because something may be doing, but what I will do is, uh, I. I'll make sure that the citizen uh, who lives closest to this is contacted before uh, we actually send this in. Uh, and if I hear a violent objection, then uh, I'll, I won't sign. We won't forward it. And uh, you'll bring it back. To I'll us. bring it back to you. So I'll, I'll make that understanding succinctly a part of my motion somehow. Yeah. It's very strange. Usually, someone knows why it's come <laughs> forward. It's come from somewhere. Right? So it it, did. is this a new poll or is a poll, an existing poll being moved? Do we know that? It looks like it might be the latter. We believe it's a replacement. A this replacement? Is the I think it is. There was a it's lot of replacement. Yes. damage in April. Yeah. Maybe that's what it has to do with what I know. And it looks from what they gave us, what was sent to us, there's what looks like maybe an existing poll location and these arrows on this piece of paper. <laughs> so it looks like it's a swap out. It looks like it's being moved 32 feet. Yes. Because they're, they're both labeled P5, which I presume is pole 5. And they do need permission to move it in the public way. But having said that, and having been through the comprehensive plan process, I look forward to the day when a town as densely populated as ours has all of our utilities underground. That would be nice. I'll, I'll vote for this, but it's okay, so making that, that pitch. We really should require them to put it under <laughs> Any other questions? I, I just had a problem making Stephen Pauliot's signature out of what was signed above that. It doesn't look like the signature. Oh, you're right. It looks like the Sandy somebody around. Looks like someone Cameron, but we'll. <laughs> We'll call, uh, and John Tomchik signed it too. He struck me out a few times in Little League, so uh, we'll figure it out. All right, thank you, Mike. All in favor? You're right, the signature doesn't know. Now, um, we come to the item of citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Anybody like to discuss anything? Okay. Move on. and. 
just to fill everybody in, on November, uh, this is November 5th tonight is the last scheduled meeting of the 2007 Town Council. It is proposed to hold a caucus of the 2008 Town Council on November 8th, uh, which is this Thursday. And the next Town Council meeting is on Monday, December 10th, 2007 at which time the town, town Council will formally reconstitute itself in 2008. Yes, Ann. If you are done with that, I had one item I just wanted to mention. Okay. Um, uh, the Appointments Committee will be considering uh, new applications to all the different boards and commissions uh, that have openings on them. So I just am mentioning this to say that people uh, in the community who are interested in serving on a board or commission, a volunteer board or commission in Cape Elizabeth should uh, look online and they will be able to apply online or they can get, if they don't have online sort of capacity, they can get a form to fill out at town hall. So I would encourage people to apply for one of the many openings that we will have on all the different boards and commissions. And um, I'm sure we'll get good people because we always have good success. But the more that apply, the better success we have. So please apply. And, and just to, following up on that, the Shore Road Pathway Committee, that, that deadline, um, which is a new committee being set up, it, the deadline for applications is November 16th. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thank you. That should be done forthwith. Very good. Okay. With I, that, I just want to wish Ruthie well with the election tomorrow. Thank oh, you. yes. Thank you very much. That's right, Ruthie. This will be your first time. Excellent. Very well. Thanks. Okay. Uh, with that, do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Yeah. And Cynthia, all in favor? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was